So I want to welcome you uh, to Alexandria, and thank you so much for organizing this uh, workshop. It seems that the, the agenda is fantastic. And I'm so happy that so many people from NSF are here, and of course our director. Uh, this is a very interesting topic that has been going on for many years, and uh, one of the main things that uh, we would like to understand is, is there something boiling up in this area of research where uh, uh, if we, for example, put investment into that, can we make a, another uh, revolution in our understanding of this very, very important for humanity systems? So I look forward to this workshop, and uh, I look forward to the, uh, we look forward to the report from the workshop and see where things are going. And I would like to thank uh, David for uh, taking the initiative and organizing this uh, workshop. And uh, David, please. Okay. Oh, maybe I'll do this because then I can. So I'm going to, on the schedule, um, I have more time than I need. And we have someone with us who's more important than me, who you probably want to ask questions of. So I'm going to be brief. I'll give a little bit of a context for this meeting. Um, and then I'll introduce the director of the National Science Foundation, Franz Cordoba, who will actually make some remarks. But then I thought we could open it up to ask Franz some difficult questions and sort of just <laughs> interrogate you as a community. And then, because I know you're not going to be here all day, so we can use the morning to ask some questions of you. And, um, but I do have three slides, and they're all art slides, so don't, they're not going to be too dull. So, yeah, um, background. So does anyone recognize this photograph? Yeah, well, it's, it is Stravinsky. So, so this is a photograph um, by the photographer Arnold Newman of Stravinsky. It's a very famous one. In fact, a friend of ours, a mutual friend of many of us, has this in his office. And it's become an iconic photograph of Stravinsky. But this is not the photograph that Newman took. Uh, the photograph that Newman took, yeah, there it is, 1946, in his studio, was this one. And because uh, he had a large format camera, and he took it back to the dark room, and he cropped it. And he cropped it into the iconic photograph that we all know. Um, and what he did is he removed all of these incidental details that in some sense, subtract from the abstraction that Newman was trying to convey. And, and many people pointed out that the abstraction that he was trying to convey was that the, if you look again at the piano more carefully, you can see it actually looks like a note. The, the planar lid of the, of the Steinway looks like an, a musical note. And, and so artists are perfectly familiar with this idea that uh, reality needs to be abstracted, and one way in which you do that effectively is you remove incidental detail. This is not the same thing as saying that the way to understand Stravinsky in his studio is to look at his atoms. Right? This is not reductionist, uh, and it's abstraction. I want to get to this uh, in a second. And here's another rather famous uh, artist. This is Chopin, who's making another remark, which is similar, I think, to the intention of Newman. Uh, which is that in music, you make huge numbers of experiments, you play with many, many notes, and in the end, the harmonious piece of work that you produce is a result of some sifting process. Now, for some weird reason, in the history of science, we identified this with another tendency, which was atomism. And by atomism, I simply mean that the deepest understanding of how something works consists in blowing it to pieces. And these two sort of scaling phenomena, one in theory, that the theory should be minimal, and one in matter, that the deepest understanding of the world comes from understanding its most elementary constituents, have become entangled. And I think the examples, though, from photography and from music demonstrate that's not the case. That there is something separable um, that allows us to say that an idea can be beautiful or elegant without that idea referring back to the most elementary atomic level of the world. 
So that is in some sense the background to much of what we do at SFI and those of us interested in complex phenomena. We do believe that you can have elegant theory, but we think that theory can be applied at effective levels. Uh, and that the deepest understanding does not necessarily consist in an understanding of the atomic levels. It's actually quite funny that this kind of reductionism applies at all levels, right? In other words, mathematicians consider the parsimony of mathematics the ultimate objective, and any epicycles added by applying mathematics to the natural world are a kind of adulteration. So physics is slightly less injurious to mathematics, and then biology slightly more, and then sociology devastating. Right? So it's very interesting that the tendency applies at any level that you begin. Um, and of course, the same goes for understanding in terms of the elementary constituents, that neuroscientists condescend to psychologists, psychologists condescend to sociologists, sociologists condescend to anthropologists, and so on. So there is some tendency to believe that whatever level you operate at is the most fundamental. Uh, and of course, it's a folly. And hopefully this conversation over the next day and a half will be, how do we find the levels at which beautiful, understandable abstractions apply that don't require recourse to lower levels? And are there theories that tell us why not? And Bob's sitting at the front here and, of course, has written a lot on this issue of mesoscopic protectorates, which is one way in which you might justify um, not going down to a, to a more basic level. I should mention um, that another motivation for this meeting was Murray Gell-Mann. And we have another meeting actually sponsored by the National Science Foundation in May, uh, actually honoring the work of Murray. Um, but Murray was, for those of you who didn't know him, he always seemed to sort of square the circle because on the one hand, he was interested in fundamental symmetries, a very physical way of thinking, but he was also obsessed with contingencies and accidents and history. And when I first met him, I thought that was squaring the circle. That was a kind of impossibility. But I now think that it is how you should be if you work in this field that we work in. Uh, that is, in adaptive phenomena. Because there's no escaping cataloging, there's no escaping taxonomy, there's no escaping being encyclopedic in order to begin to slowly come to terms with the phenomena that you then want to identify regularities in. So I don't think, I thought they were contradictory, but now I believe they're essential. Um, and so in this room, um, there are people who have been doing both. And we picked areas where we feel that the phenomena point towards universal effective theories that are non-reductive. And so we have neuroscience represented, we have ecology represented, scaling phenomena represented, and so on. All these areas were actually, I think, we're beginning to see what looks like a very new kind of science. Um, and I'm very excited about that. So that's the background of this meeting. A little bit of a report uh, from the trenches, those people who have been trying to find general principles in areas where physicists actually, weirdly enough, say there aren't any. There's an extraordinary imperialism uh, which, which claims that the only area where you might find them are those areas where you go atomistic, which is obviously false. Uh, but with that, I will turn it over to France. And as I said, I would like to open this up uh, after your presentation to ask some questions about what NSF is doing in this area of theory and what your thoughts are in terms of a program that is as ambitious, theoretically, as physics has been, but in areas that, for some reason, are dominated by description and what your thoughts are along those lines. So, Franz. I, I need it today. Hello, everybody. I, I have a cold, so, yeah, so I'm going to drink my water and make a few formal remarks. And then David has... Uh, uh, trying to prepare me for the unexpected here, for your questions. Uh, so first, it's wonderful to be here. And David actually asked me when I came in this morning, he said, why are we here? And I said, well, do you have this conference? And he said, no, I mean here, here. Uh, and I, right here in Alexandria, this, this corner in this hotel. And I said, well, it's because 
the new NSF is right next door. So we moved here two years ago. And um, you would have thought when, as we were in the process of moving for three years, that we were moving um, to the other side of the country. It was a very big deal for all of our employees. It was only nine miles away. But, uh, but it was very big. And um, I remember that pivotal moment when we, we moved this big, our big central computer on, uh, with a, a huge truck. And we had police cars in front of it and police cars behind it. And I said, I hope the day comes when that thing is all in the cloud and we're not moving <laughs> it <laughs> physically. So that, that was a, a momentous moment. Anyway, we're here. If you get a chance, uh, those of you who haven't been in the, in the new building, it is, uh, it is a wonderful building. And so I was very relieved because half the workforce had threatened to leave, resign, if, if we were going to go through with the move, which, of course, we didn't have to do with it. It's, it's an entity called the Government Services Administration, which moves people around. But um, we, we, we did move, and people just loved the, the new environment. And um, I, I think you would find it very interesting if you wanted to wander over there. So um, a another thing that was mentioned in, in David's remarks was Murray Gelman. So I was a graduate student at Caltech when he was, of course, a professor there for a very long time. And we were um, in awe, as we should have been, of him and Richard Feynman. And we would go to lectures um, at the Caltech Y there um, in the, what is now the student center, and we would listen to them uh, talking about how awful it was to have the Nobel Prize because there was no time to get back to work and do things. They were always giving talks and, and such. And so um, act actually Feynman was one of my teachers for quantum mechanics because I was a physics student, but, uh, but Murray wasn't. And so I thought it was a wonderful moment when many years later I was in Aspen for a workshop, I had a roommate who had a place there, and and we uh, encountered Murray somehow through that visit, and um, and he introduced himself to my former um, Stanford roommate as um, my former teacher, and I thought, how wonderful that you know that that he wants to take credit. <laughs> <laughs> for, for um, so it, it felt like a compliment to me because um, I don't think he remembered that he actually wasn't my teacher, but um, but in many ways, of course, we we all are uh, teachers uh, to those that we encounter and, and um, on in any way uh, at conference like this because um, we learn from their example. And Murray and uh, uh, Richard Feynman were both on the same floor that I was. I was lucky when I was a graduate student, there were hardly any students. And, um, and certainly I was the only one of two women, by the way. But anyway, um, they were right down the hall and down Slorts and buildings. So that, that, was, uh, that was wonderful to get to know him. And then at the Santa Fe Institute, so we're very pleased at NSF to co-sponsor this workshop. NSF, interestingly, began supporting the Santa Fe Institute 34 years ago. It started with a grant to Murray for $6,000, a wonderful amount, for a workshop in 1985 on infinite dimensional Lie algebras and fundamental particle theories. And since then, the Santa Fe Institute has received more than 100 NSF grants across nearly two dozen NSF divisions. So. As you know, many of today's most exciting areas of research rely on convergent approaches that combine expertise and creativity to tackle big questions. And that's been really our middle name at NSF for the six years that I've been there as director is to really to, to think big and to keep opening in our minds to new kinds of connections. So we think of biotechnology, big data, quantum computing, or artificial intelligence. Those all um, started as um, uh, big ideas a long time ago, but they've la lately, because of various technological advances, really come into the forefront. And they are administration priorities as well. At NSF, co uh, convergence research is the common denominator. And um, we have a strategic framework called the 10 Big Ideas, and convergence lies at the heart 
of, um, of each of those and also the connections among them, which keep being more and more apparent all the time. It's an integral element of uh, a new um, organizational approach, I'd call it, that we've adopted called the Convergence Accelerator. And this is our effort to try to get basic research, some of it on a faster track to translation. We know that many forms of basic research which are um, just inspired by curiosity don't have an endpoint in mind, so we can't predict when they will have outcomes that will have impact. We're pursuing them because we're, we're curious. We just want to know the answers. But there's a lot of research that we sponsor that actually does have a light at the end of the tunnel. We think we know where we're going. Um, for example, having interoperable databases because we have so much data and it's very hard for people to, um, first of all, access it, but then to interpret it and to cross uh, manage it so that you can come out with new kinds of synthesis of new ideas and all and putting it together. And so interoperability we feel is one of those examples of something that can converge rapidly to conclusion with more investment. Another uh, idea along those lines that we've been investing in is something called um, the future of work at the human technology frontier. And there are many, um, many aspects of how to conceive of work environments where work can be an educational classroom, it can be uh, a, a hospital, uh, it can be an, an aging facility, can be uh, an advanced manufacturing floor, it can be many types of work. But, but people have a vision of outcomes and they just need a little bit of investment to, uh, to get there to invest in the basic research. So we issued our first set of Convergence Accelerator Awards in September and are planning to launch the next phase of the program very shortly. Several of our big ideas share themes central to the Santa Fe Institute's mission, themes like complexity, convergence, and universality. For example, in harnessing the data revolution, we're tackling the uh, ubiquitous interconnectivity of massive data sets, as I was giving an example of. So um, another example would be understanding the rules of life. That's one of our big ideas. It comes out of um, biology, but it extends to many areas of NSF. It's our big idea to explore universal principles that underline the evolution from genotype to phenotype and to understand the connections between processes at different scales from the micro scale of biological systems to the macro scale of global ecosystems. Artificial intelligence, of course, can be thought of as a convergence tool, one that undergirds a wide range of research from big data to biotechnology. It's changing the meaning of work and productivity, so we're supporting a lot of research on artificial intelligence at the human technology frontier. And in fact, this afternoon, I'll be at the White House um, co-chairing with the head of DARPA, the uh, White House's committee, select committee on artificial intelligence. We're trying to get all the agencies to really define what approaches they're going after and what the investment can look like overall. The White House is very interested in us upping our investments, so I think that if I could foreshadow the next president's budget, there'll be a big investment in um, artificial intelligence and uh, everything to do with uh, quantum, uh, especially quantum information sciences. But at NSF, we like to think of quantum as being much broader than uh, only information sciences. So new breakthroughs and accelerated processes uh, or progress we feel will amplify the changes that we see in our daily lives in our cities, nations, and around the globe. So the Institute's work to comprehend these communities and systems, its work on cities, um, as well as human social impacts uh, are just becoming more urgent and it is our uh, intention to invest in those wanted to uh, share in closing a uh, PBS program that I saw on origami, which um, many people think is 
you know, the, the art, I would say the, uh, the complicated art, the simple art of folding paper, but it's inspired researchers in many disciplines leading to new ways of conceptualizing everything from protein folding to satellite construction to chemical structures, and even in my interest, since I'm an astrophysicist, the formation of galaxies and more. It takes great ingenuity to recognize that universality can connect the folds of a sheet of paper to the structure of the universe. And uh, I think the Santa Fe Institute is a place that can appreciate that. It has an animating spirit of creativity, innovation, and intellectual adventure that fosters that kind of thinking. So as we move ahead to new frontiers characterized by uh, complexity, we'll rely on your, um, your insight, your great ideas, and commitment to uh, discovery and to opening our minds to thinking in new ways to uh, take uh, the kernel of NSF's approach to big ideas uh, to new uh, kinds of big ideas like what David was just talking about and what this conference is all about. So thank you and um, welcome to the new NSF land. And that many people, I'm sure, in this room are thinking about, which is this um, rapprochement between AI, machine learning, and natural science. Because in many domains, prediction uh, is at a premium. Yes. And in the world of complex phenomena, we have lots and lots of free parameters. Machine learning does really well. But as you know, it's something of a black box. Right. <laughs> and whereas we, many of us trained in the natural sciences, you know, are very happy with approximation and favor mechanism and understanding. And I'm wondering how NSF thinks about that. Should there be an effort, a very purposeful effort, to try and reconcile the styles of reasoning that go into machine learning and AI with the kinds of reasoning that we're familiar with in the natural sciences? Or will they just diverge and eventually the predictive power of AI will undermine the scientific enterprise? Well, I, I can't predict that that will happen. Uh, I, I think w we have an, an opportunity that, we, um, that is open right now for um, AI institutes, and I think maybe some of you have seen that um, call for proposals. And I think this is a, a wonderful opportunity, especially since we've identified six areas that we want to invest in. And uh, it, it frankly looks like, because we just got our um, command to re-engineer uh, re our budget, which we'll be working on today for the president's release of the budget in February, looks like there'll be even more emphasis, if I can foreshadow without uh, saying its contents for Shauri, even more work um, around AI and all its many manifestations. You know, the, the, the good thing about AI from, from my perspective is that it's, it's so little understood by, by people and it's, it's such a, a big, uh, it, it involves so many different approaches that you can do almost anything with an, an AI framework. So I would, I would just suggest that what you're exploring or suggesting could very easily go under one of the, the six um, areas that we've identified in this initial solicitation, which is um, about discovery in physics. And we have another one on discovery in, in chemistry. Others are more to do with uh, principles of fairness and, and a bias and transparency and accountability in AI, um, AI in agriculture, and I'm not remembering all the different areas, but I think this one in, in putting it in a, in a framework of the, the physical world um, would, be, would be a very interesting opportunity and I, I think would be very welcome, uh, a proposal on those lines. And, um, of course, I, I know David very well, but I don't know all of you, so please tell me your, your name, something about yourself. Hi, I'm Sam Gershman. I'm a psychologist at Harvard. Uh, and I, I, I just wanted to 
push farther on the last question because you're mentioning that there are various solicitations for discovery um, through artificial intelligence. And I guess I would like to ask you, what is discovery? And, and to, to make that point more specific, um, imagine a paradigm in which we had very powerful machine learning algorithms in which we could take all the data available to natural science and feed it into those algorithms. And at the other end come predictions about various phenomena when, are, when do earthquakes happen, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. um, now, is that, w would that qualify as a discovery? Are, are, th are those systems capable of making discoveries? Because usually in the history of science when we talk about discovery, we're talking about um, the description of, of explanatory uh, laws governing phenomena. And um, I think it's, I think, a, a paradigm that's built around prediction is putting stress on that notion. I'm not, I'm not making a judgment whether that's good or bad, but I, I'd be curious to hear how you, yeah, as, as an but institution, but thinks about that. But you're also looking for, for patterns, right? I mean, when it comes to earthquake, you're trying to make a lot of, take a lot of data and, and see where there are, are correlations mm -hmm. and um, see if, if, you know, in the machine learning sense where patterns can emerge, right? But, but so the system, the prediction system, may or may not care about um, patterns that we would consider explanations. Um, the point being that you don't, for, to make correct predictions, we as the external observers don't need to know anything about what's inside, what patterns the, the prediction technology is discovering, right? Even if it's discovering things, it may be unintelligible to us, and, and that could be totally fine for the purposes of prediction. Does it, does it satisfy our desiderata for discovery of meaningful patterns. I realize this is a very vexed philosophical question yes, and uh, right. it's not really the NSF's <laughs> job to answer that, right? But implicitly in, in designating My the agenda, right, it has yeah. to answer it in some capacity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly a, a different world for me to think about that since my next meeting I'm going to, uh, to address the Office of Management and Budgets um, <laughs> budget that they just gave us and how we're going to ask for more money. But um, <laughs> Yes, so, um, no, I... I, I appreciate the question. I, I don't have anything to um, to contribute there. I'm. Um, uh, I think we're on a new frontier here in trying to, uh, and, and that's why I, I I just think it's important that groups like this that are thinking um, deeply in, in in different ways, not the usual ways about machine learning, deep learning, are you know are are, are putting forth. Um, proposals to explore it in, in other ways. You know, like for myself, okay, I'm an astrophysicist, and what I really want to understand is, is the dark sector, dark energy and dark matter, and there's a lot of questions there. There's also a lot of data there. There's a lot of stuff that's been written, uh, a lot of things in other languages, too, that normally the people don't read unless they can read those other languages, but that are very important in all this to think about. And so in my spare moments, I think, can we use artificial intelligence just to, you know, at, at the first instance, put together the knowledge that is already out there that is very disparate and is, that is a lot of which is inaccessible or is just too much and nobody is exploring it to uh, better describe what we already kind of know but not not any one person knows or any one group knows. It's just knowledge that is all over the place. And, and put it together and see if there's any way that we can have a better, firmer understanding that, that guides us in certain directions of exploration of what is the next thing to do. Because frankly, so again, just staying in that d dark matter, uh, dark energy lane, we as, um, uh, as an agency have put a whole lot of money into very limited approaches to understanding those those mysteries. A, a, a lot of money, and and the people who are doing them uh, say, "Don't abandon us. We're you know we're on the verge. We're going we're going to prove that that this particular theory, this concept, is going to give us the answer." I, I you know I'm not so sure. I think there's a world of young emerging scholars out there of all different sorts of experiments, tabletop experiments, ways of thinking, as I said, a lot of data that could be mined 
uh, first to understand that there are, there's a huge parameter space that is unexplored uh, on that area. And so that's, that's what I look to artificial intelligence to sort of help us um, uh, in some ways provide new, open up new directions by just um, synthesizing and understanding the knowledge that is already out there but is not aggregated. That's Hi, uh, I'm Josh Grochow. I'm a computer scientist and mathematician at Boulder. Um, I have sort of a meta question for you, which is um, I'm curious if the NSF is exploring um, different either sort of internal organizational structures or different models of funding, um, not necessarily as sort of a, a wholesale change, but even just exploring, uh, you know, are there some kinds of programs where the traditional, you know, oh, we have a call for this, we have a program officer, et cetera, kind of doesn't work. Because I feel like, for particularly for a lot of the highly interdisciplinary sort of, you know, convergence type research, it's not clear to me that the traditional funding model always works. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And that's why we, so we bring in um, rotators uh, from the, largely the university community. And I, I see some of them here, like Donald sitting behind Jeff West here. And, um, and so they bring those, uh, and, and we have t about 200 of them, they bring those perspectives on how we can change things up. I, I, I think we need a lot of change, and if I were going to stay there another six years, that's, but, but it, takes, it takes a lot of time to, to understand how you're structured. We are, we are turning 70, this is my 70th pin, uh, next year, and we're going to have a lot of celebrations of science and technology. We're using it as a launch point for for getting folks together. We're uh, doing the first history of NSF. It's all 70 years. We, we just uh, this week re uh, reissuing Science, the Endless Frontier. We're having a huge symposium on February 6th. You can put that on your calendar. All previous NSF directors will be there. But no matter what you do when you're an institution, you you just get boxed into silos. And even when you know, even our, our big ideas, even though they were fresh in May of 2016 when we announced them, they are they are now kind of siloed. And we we and and yet we see every day that artificial intelligence and, and quantum and 5G and synthetic biology they all have overlaps where we can take them you know, to new areas by converging them. And we, we have to have an organization that is dynamic, that is constantly converging across the silos. We're trying to do that in a budget sense with our steward model, where we have a certain directorate will be the steward of, say, quantum. But the proposals can come from anywhere. They can come from biology, make quantum biology proposals. They can be from materials or chemistry. They can be from engineering, but and and not just from math and physical sciences where they're stewarded. And so, we're we're, we're constantly aware that we should take down silos. But but you know people um, and program, you know it's 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 the way you're structured. And when you're a certain size and. Jeff knows all about this because he studies cities, and when they get to, and I heard you on NPS on Sunday, and I listened to the whole hour, bloody hour of it, of Jeff on, on cities, and when they get to be a certain size, they share common characteristics, and certainly federal agencies do too. So by bringing in rotators, uh, uh, bringing in people from the university community, and this is really my bid to ask all of you to think about doing that, just come for two years up to four years, and you know, and change things, challenge the way we're doing things, and say, I don't care to have fifteen million dollars to do my one little program here. What I really want to do is join with the people in the other directorates here, and we want to go in this whole new area, and we would want to pool all our monies together and go in that area. But no matter what way we structure ourselves, believe me, at the end of that, they become the new silos. Okay. And, and we, so we, we, we just have to keep recognizing that we need to go across those. Yeah. So just hearing the first set of questions about machine learning discovery and what? Oh, hi, sorry, yeah. I'm Van Savage, and I'm um, at UCLA, and I'm in ecology and evolutionary biology, as well as computational medicine. Um, yeah, and so 
thinking about the first few comments I heard um, about this idea of what counts as discovery and how does machine learning fit in as a guide to look through data and help guide us, it seems that, in my mind, the um, if you can predict the idea is that that does mean there's some explanation or needs, but it may not be accessible to us. And to the extent we want to use it to help guide us in the future, it can only guide us if we are have access to that explanation underlying it. So trying yeah. to understand how to get to that explanation underlying the prediction of machine learning, mm -hmm. that seems like a major thing necessary to help use it as a guide. But what silo at NSF would that be? Would it only in your vision that will be funded through specific projects where that happens as part of the specific project? Or could that be like a large goal in itself? And if so, like what silo would that fit inside of? Well, it, it can come in all sorts of ways. And we've, we spend, this may surprise you, but uh, uh, this past year we've spent $500 million on AI. But, but AI, as I said earlier, is, is really broad. And so we, we part, uh, the computer and information science and engineering director called SIES will partner with social and behavioral and economic sciences and it, it and with 50 um, industries that are connected with an entity called the Partnership for AI, and they will explore um, biases. They will explore the the thing you suggested that we don't, um, you know, we don't really understand some of the what the machines are telling us and and the the kind of the black box phenomenon. They're exploring um, uh, transparency and fairness and all that. We have a big uh, on another branches, we have a big collaboration with Amazon on fairness and ethics in um, transparency and accountability, F-E-A-T, feet, in, um, in AI. And, and then we have these, uh, these institutes. So uh, what I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that, is that the world is wide open and certainly wide open at the National Science Foundation. We don't have laboratories like DOE and NASA does. We our laboratory is you all, is UCLA and and all the other places you come from, S SFI and so on. And um, and we 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 welcome um, uh, new proposals in anything to do with any type of exploration. And the advantage we have over other agencies is that they. Well, DOE has to feed its laboratories, and that's fine. I was Los Alamos lab for 10 years. I appreciated that. Um, and, um, and, and the Department of Defense has to uh, feed its very specific mission, uh, as does do most of the other agencies. But our mission is simply to further the progress of science. And, and that, that progress comes about in, in all sorts of ways, including this conference today, and that's why we're so eager to fund it, to try to lift us up and take us in new ways of thinking in new directions. And, and you see, we, we all have, I mean, you have a very deep knowledge of where you're going and universality and everything. It's a lexicon that others are not familiar with. When David talks half the time, half my mind goes blank because I have no idea what he's talking about. But, but the other half is very engaged and I want to go there. So, so that's great. It's great to have a leader like that. Um, so you, you would... Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, so I'll take one more question, and then I better get to doing the budget so you have some money for next year. Yeah, so so uh, mine is, is a kind of question, suggestion. Oh, sorry. Yes, Jessica Flack. I'm a professor at the Santa Fe Institute. I work on collective computation, collective stuff. And um, thinking about how to review proposals from communities like this is obviously you know a challenge for NSF and other agencies. And uh, one, uh, one thing I wonder is to what extent NSF has looked to the collective behavior, collective intelligence literature to think about better ways of reviewing. One idea that pops into my mind is that individuals should not be reviewers. It actually, it actually might be much more beneficial to have research groups or teams that are known to be transdisciplinary serving as the kind of reviewer. And the reason I suggest that is because these, so you might say like the reviewing panel is that already. There's a bunch of different types of scientists on the panel that's kind of interdisciplinary, but they don't have a common language, they don't have a common history together. So if you were to give the proposal to an interdisciplinary team, even if it was somewhat different from the, you know, the, the expertise in the proposal itself, you might get a much, a much better response or a much more informed um, set of reviews. And, the, and just one final point along these lines is, 
for, from any interdisciplinary team has individuals on it with expertise. And, and it's very rarely the case that, that the, even the, the group head is an expert in all of the areas that they draw on to do their research. And so having the whole team review the proposal might be really, really um, useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. And we, we would love your ideas, Jessica, on, on new ways of, of having reviews. We, the, uh, I'm told that the program officers spend uh, a third of their time in trying to identify reviewers. And in fact, our initial foray into applying artificial intelligence or uh, some form of it to the review process was to um, get our, um, we have a giant database, of course, of everybody who's ever proposed whether they've gotten the money or not, and to, to look through that and help the reviewers by producing some candidate reviewers and also to increase the diversity and inclusion of the review um, uh, body. So that's, that's one thing that I, I think has really helped um, uh, help reduce uh, the workload by just presenting more reviewers. We've had a very um, difficult time in the convergence realm. We now, uh, convergence itself is one of the big ideas and all of the big ideas we hope are themselves convergent. And so we have a lot of proposals that come in as purely convergence proposals. And so w the initial thing to do was we, we combined our program officers uh, who all do um, more or less know each other through and uh, get to know each other throughout the uh, at the agency in order to review the initial set of proposals so we could build up a cohort from the people whose proposals were accepted eventually of people of like mind who could see convergence and all because if you just have one physicist and one geologist they could argue that it's you know it's not deep enough this proposal in this discipline or that discipline so we're we're trying uh, different things but we always welcome um, new insights and I will take your suggestion back to the group. Um, merit review is something that our National Science Board cares about very much. Uh, every year we put out the merit review report. It's all online. You can see who gets what and what the age level is and um, you know everything about and the, the gender uh, equity and so forth of the merit review process. But it's always um, uh, it, it, it will always be a little flawed. You know, it's just it's just not um, not easy for people to make decisions when faced with you know with so many proposals. And the program officers also like to tell me that 80% of um, American scientists hate them because they turn down their proposals, and um, and it, and they have to make all those phone calls, and um, and only 20% get the happy news. And so that's also not a good place to be. So I consider a big part of my job is just fighting for more because I don't think you can do more with less that we need uh, just, you know, e everybody right now, the, the big issue in the Beltway, um, and uh, some of you are lucky just to be here for this conference and, and then go uh, somewhere else t um, to have clearer thinking, but, but the, the big issue is the whole science and security question. And uh, we've in and what what we do about our competitors and um, and so the the big China question comes up a lot and that's something that will certainly impact universities if if we make the wrong moves on that but we have to act together as a whole federal government so we spend a huge amount of time um, explaining why international collaboration is so very important and has got us to be. As, um, as great a nation as we are and as advanced in science and technology. And we can't let that go. What we need to do is have the right protocols and protections so we do protect our intellectual property and we encourage all nations of the world to have the openness and transparency and fairness in their um, proposal uh, process and, their, and releasing their, their data and their publications and so forth that we do. But these are all um, these are all kinds of big questions that converge on what individuals like yourselves that have great ideas are able to do in a, in a kind of an unconstrained way. So our our merit review process has to 
you know, just take all of that into account. So I appreciate that. And again, it's a call for others to, um, if you're willing to, you know, change the world and change science and technology to come to NSF. I think the um, those of you who are rotators in this room will say it's a, it's just a great experience. And and the um, and the government is really crying out for for really. Um, really the, the, the best ideas about the whole funding process um, as well as what we fund and the priorities that we make. So with that, I'll say goodbye and have a great conference and I appreciate being a part of it.